there are the classic triumph over tragedies stories and the extraordinary hardworking immigrant stories and the sacrifices of the parents for their children's stories. But rarely have I read about a family or a mother as inspiring as the Edgy 04 family of Nigeria and England who are all of those stories and more. Zane Asher, the international anchor of One World on CNN, is the beneficiary of this extraordinary mother and family. Her new book, Where the Children Take Us, How One Family Achieved the Unimaginable, is stunning, prescriptive, and a dramatic reminder of the saying that a goal is a dream with a deadline, or as Shakespeare says, action is eloquence. Zane, please accept my warmest welcome to Just the Right Book. Thank you so much, Roxanne. What a lovely introduction. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. I, you know, I'm, I've become a um, avid fan. People, I think, are sick of talking to me because all I do is talk about your book. Um, <laughs> uh, so all that might have destroyed your family occurred on an ordinary Sunday in September of 1988 when you were five years old. Please share with us those series of events that began with just a phone call. Yeah, so um, gosh, it's, it's, you know, even though I have to talk about it um, quite a bit, now the book is out, it is really hard to go back there. But it was a Sunday in September. As you mentioned, I was five years old. Um, my mom was in the living room between the living room and the kitchen and she was waiting for my dad to call because my dad and my brother were on a father-son road trip and she was expecting my dad to call to say hey we've landed back in London come to Heathrow or Gatwick airport to come and pick us up and um, my mom actually got ready uh, because she knew what flight what time the flight was supposed to land and um, the phone call never came and she was waiting hours and hours and that phone call never came and she was getting anxious. But her, in her mind, the worst case scenario was that they'd missed their flight, you know? Mm. Um, and so the phone rings at about 6.30 in the evening and the voice on the other end of the line is not my dad. It's um, a, an extended relative in Nigeria, which is where the father and son road trip was taking place. And the voice on the other end of the line simply said, um, your husband and your son have been involved in a car crash. One of them is dead and we don't know which one. And, um, you know, everything just stopped for my mom. You know, everything was in sort of slow motion. You know, she couldn't breathe. She was just, I mean, the way she has always described it is an emotional earthquake. Mm -hmm. I write in the book that <clears throat> oftentimes, you know, we've all been through it where you're waiting to hear from a loved one and, you know, they're supposed to call you or you're trying to get a hold of them. Um, and in those hours or minutes that go by, everyone, maybe for a split second, might think the worst. Yeah. But normally the worst never happens, you know, that that's, you know, I, 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 we've all been through that where you're waiting for your husband to call or your son to call. Um, but usually the worst doesn't happen. And, and this was one of those times where my mother for a split second feared the worst and the worst actually happened. Mm. So, um, she gets on the next flight possible to Nigeria and the entire journey, she's not entirely sure what she's gonna find when she lands. She doesn't know who she's gonna be burying, whether it's gonna be her husband or her son. And um, <clears throat> people who haven't read the book, my dad and my brother were on this road trip across Nigeria and they were going from a place called Enugu, which is a relatively small town, um, towards Lagos, which is like the New York of Nigeria. And it's a six hour journey. And somewhere along that stretch, the man driving them swerved into the opposite lane to cut traffic. And as they went round a bend, the driver obviously came into a blind spot and the car was hit by a tractor trailer. And everybody in the car, was killed instantly apart from one person in the back seat where my dad and my brother were sitting. And so that is how the story um, starts off. And obviously, as you know, it was my dad who um, mm -hmm. died in that crash. And even the story 
Zane, that they brought all the bodies to the morgue. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, you know, this is Nigeria, 1988. The, um, the emergency services and the passers-by who came to the scene initially thought that everybody had died. I mean, that is what it looked like. Um, and so everybody, all the passengers were taken into a truck and driven to a morgue. And it was only when the driver basically arrived at the morgue and began unloading the bodies that he realized one of them was actually still breathing. And that was my oldest brother. So um, Chuata was still breathing and he was started shouting, oh my gosh, this one is alive. And that's, um, and that's how, that's sort of also why there was so much confusion because initially our relatives back in our village were all told that there was this accident and everyone had passed away. And then several hours later, you know, different family members had heard actually no, no no there was might have been one survivor and so they were kind of still debating and not really knowing what was what had actually happened because no one had actually gotten to the scene or the hospital they were just sort of hearing different things um and that was what was happening when one person actually called my mother they just didn't know you know um mm. so yeah so zane in the early there's a moment early in the book that to me, ended up defining so much of what you write about after. Your, your mother can, at this point, barely function. Um, she, her husband's gone. Her uh, brilliant son, your brother, has been expelled from uh, school. Chuatel is still alone in a dilapidated hospital, thousands of miles away and she's literally hiding under the covers in her darkened bedroom and you describe that a sense of calm encompasses her and the thought that anchors her is the term remember who you are what did that mean to her yeah, so <clears throat> even before my father passed away, my mother had already been through so much in her life. Um, she, as you know, survived a civil war in Nigeria, um, a civil war that was so brutal, so ugly, so vicious that um, people had to eat snakes to survive because starvation mm -hmm. was used as a weapon of war. So my mom ate snakes, she ate, you know, termites, I mean, people ate lizards. And she was the oldest child in her family. My grandmother ended up having about nine kids total. But at that time, she'd only had about six or seven or so. My mother was the oldest. And so it was her job, even as a 14, 15 year old, to take care of her younger siblings and to make sure that her siblings did not die of starvation as so many others did. And so, one of her jobs was to go out to the marketplace and sell cassava. And, um, you know, she risked her life doing that. There was, there's one episode I write about in the book where she's selling cassava, hoping to make a little bit of money to buy some extra food for the entire family. I mean, she, I mean, the entire family's weight is in, on her shoulders. Mm. Um, she's almost like a parent in a way. And so while she's doing that, while she's selling cassava in the marketplace, she suddenly hears machine gun fire raining down. There are explosions. She runs into the bush with her younger brother, my uncle. And she looks back and people that she'd been speaking to just minutes earlier are now lying lifeless on the ground. <clears throat> you know, she is just, I mean, the marketplace was utter carnage. And it's really seared into her memory because, you know, so much for just a child. I mean, she was 14, 15 years old to go through and to witness and to carry the responsibility of looking after her family. And um, one of the things that she sort of taught her younger siblings that was obviously passed down from my grandmother is that during those times, never ever finish your food. Even though everybody around you is starving, it sort of sounds counterintuitive, but never ever finish yeah. your food because you don't know when your next meal is coming. So the idea is that if you have a little bit of yam, some rice, you know, a grasshopper or whatever, you only eat half 
and then you save the rest for the next day because you don't know when your next meal is coming. And during that time, her, young, <clears throat> her younger brother, Arthur, also died as well. And so my mother had seen a lot. She'd experienced a lot and there was an inner strength in her that she hadn't really tapped into in a, in a long time, an inner strength that sort of remained dormant for many, many years. But that is what she drew from in those quiet moments um, when she was just contemplating what was happening to her family. And the thing that, you know, there are a series of things that she comes up with as solutions to, you know, what she would consider errant behavior by, by one of the four of you. Well, not your littlest sister. Your littlest sister, at least in this book, there doesn't seem to have been any corrective behavior that your mother had to um, go to, but the fact that she conjured up these ideas and the first, the first thing that she conjures up aside from like going into high gear chores for all of you is she literally brings herself to a bookstore and decides that there's going to be a family book club. So I'm struck by a couple of things with that. Your mother was not uneducated. She had, uh, studied and became a pharmacist and had a pharmacy. But, you know, even still, I know from our bookstore that there are people who are intimidated by going into a bookstore, but your mother marches into the bookstore somewhere in London and has them tell her all the classics, you know, maybe she had heard of them, maybe she hadn't. And she decides that you're going to have a family book club. Now you have, you know, James and the giant peach, but these guys are like doing <laughs> the three musketeers. So how, how do you think she came up with it? And did, and did it really work? Did everybody sort of get on the, get on the, get on with the game? Yeah. So she came up with it because, so my mother's education is interesting because, so her education was interrupted by war. So during mm. um, high school, there were like two and a half to almost three years where she did not go to school at all. However, prior to that, she was actually relatively well-educated. So it's sort of this weird mixed bag yeah. with her that up until the age of about 14, um, she was educated by British nuns. I mean, Nigeria was a colonial country at that time. And um, she was educated in the Northern part of Nigeria, Jos, which was like a, a major sort of commercial hub for the British. And her dad had a good job working for the tin mines, which was run by the British. However, the war changed everything for her. So, you know, it, it's sort of like she is kind of educated, but kind of not, if, if that makes any mm -hmm. sense. You know? No, it does. Um, so, you know, th there's, just, there's this massive gap, you know, when she should have been learning. Although my grandmother was, and I write about this in the book, was very encouraging academically, whereby, you know, even though her ch children weren't necessarily going to school for two and a half to three years, she did sort of give them donated books to work through on their own. She did teach the younger kids basic math, the kinds of things that they would be learning in school. And also my dad was somebody who was very, very well read. And so when it came to the classics, it was like her level of English literature kind of had stopped, you know, it was like a 14 year olds or 13 it got hijacked. It got hijacked. But then being married to my dad, she was aware. My dad Who was a doctor. He was a doctor, but he had he had the mind of an artist. He was incredibly creative. He loved writing songs. He loved reading. He loved. He was poetry. a good dancer. He was a great dancer. I mean, you know, even though he was technically a trainee doctor in his heart, he was an artist. And if, I think that if he could have had his own way and, and not sort of felt under pressure by his own sort of family in Nigeria to become obviously as an immigrant, you know, you, you feel the need to become a doctor or a lawyer or those kinds of jobs. If he had his own way, he would probably be a professional full-time musician and that's it. And so because my mum was married to him, she was aware of the importance of literature and this idea that literature could change worlds and could, you know, especially as a single mother with her oldest son kind of sort of going off the rails at that point, hanging out with the wrong crowd, she needed something to anchor them. And it wasn't so far-fetched to get us on board because my dad had always shared a love, of, a love of literature with his sons up until that point. So it was easier, although my oldest brother, Abinzi, did still rebel um, 
for the sort of first few months. But um, he was also, prior to my dad's death, a very good student as well. He was somebody who was winning awards in school. And so it wasn't as hard as you might imagine. To sort wasn't of as big a leap. It wasn't as big a leap as you might imagine. No, because because my dad was so obsessed with literature, you know, and he would always, um, I mean, I was too young at the time, but he would always encourage my brothers to be reading something. And academic was academics were, were a big focus of his. And, you know, my eldest brother was a brilliant student, you know, so much so that actually at his first school, the headmaster told my parents, listen, this child is way too intelligent to be here. He needs to go to a different school. Um, so they had that foundation. Um, so yeah, it worked. I mean, it, it didn't work right away, especially with my oldest brother who was still hanging out on the streets and getting into all sorts of uh, up to no good. But um, it, he eventually came around, you know, because he'd always had a love of literature and, you know, yeah, so it, it, it worked eventually. But, you know, one of the things that occurs to me is I'm listening to you speak and uh, growing up as the child of immigrants with heavy accents that, you know, how much do you think your parents or you ran into because your mother had a Nigerian accent where people presumed she was less educated than she was? Do you think that that was something that she had to just knock out of her mind or didn't even notice but was present? No, she definitely noticed that. That was, I mean, she came to England, they came to England in the early 70s, and immigration was a huge hot button issue. I mean, yeah, that was all the politicians seemed to be talking about. You know, there was this whole sort of, I don't want to call it a campaign or a movement, but definitely a common refrain among the far right leaders in the UK at the time was keep England white, you know, and that was something that so she just sort of felt generally unwelcomed. People thought that people from Africa were not educated at all. And so she definitely felt that um, people looked down upon her, which I think is quite common for people who are either minorities or immigrants coming yeah. to the country. I mean, when, when my parents moved, when my parents were um, uh, liberated, and came to the United States in the 40s and 46, you know, th there were lots of people who didn't want, they, you know, they turned some ships around that brought, so I, and they were white. Mm -hmm. So I think that this, it, you know, the US and Britain were isolationists for a long time. Uh, but it, one of the things I learned so much about was Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, you know, I'm a little bit embarrassed to admit how little I knew other than I considered Lagos a very sophisticated Western kind of a city pre the Civil War. But you talk about in the book, I mean, there are some amazing statistics that you've got that Nigerians make up 1% of the Black population in the United States but represented in a year, 25% of the black students at Harvard Business School, that in 2021, three of the top five richest people in the, in, in of black people in the world were Nigerian, mm -hmm. and that Nigerians represent the most, the most educated immigrant group in the United States, uh, also at, at, a, at a moment in time. So what is it about Nigerians that has contributed to that kind of mark on the world? Well, there's so many things. I mean, you know, we'll get to some of the um, parenting strategies that I talk about in the book. But one of the reasons why I had a hard time writing this book is because I know that some of the stuff that my mother did for us, such as the Family Book Club, um, such as, you know, we're going to talk about the school syllabus and Shakespeare yeah, the, the school syllabus <laughs> is actually not uncommon for a lot of Nigerians. You mm. know, when I talk to my Nigerian friends and I say, well, you know, these are the things my mom did. And they're like, yeah, so yeah, of course, very common. And so I, I was, I was on the fence about writing this book. I thought, 
well, are people actually going to learn anything from this? This is so common among Nigerians. But my friends who are American was like, are you kidding me? This is so, this is almost revolutionary. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think that one of the reasons why Nigerians, so aside from all of the stuff that my mother did, sort of these innovative and very unique parenting strategies, which which we'll talk about, um, it's also this idea. I went to Nigeria quite recently. I went about two months ago. And... um, you know, Nigeria has a lot of problems. If I'm perfectly honest with you, there are issues when it comes to, you know, power shortages, infrastructure, infrastructure challenges, you know, you might be working at your office and suddenly, you know, the power goes out. That is very common. Um, You know, people tend to have three or four cell phones, one for each different network, just in case one network cuts out, you have another cell phone, another cell phone, etc. There's major infrastructure challenges. So when I was in Nigeria quite recently, I mean, I was lucky if I got one thing done all day, because I might start a project and then you know, suddenly the light goes out and my computer's not charged and there's no internet or there's no power, et cetera. I have to think to myself, okay, I need to go to this person's house or this particular hotel to work, et cetera. So productivity is a, is a major, major challenge. When I come to America, um, I'm amazed at how productive I can be because I don't have to worry about power supply or power outages or energy issues or bad roads or poor infrastructure. I can just get my job done. And I think for a lot of immigrants coming out of Nigeria, because they are trained in that kind of environment, in an environment where they're doing battle every day, having to contend with all these infrastructure challenges. I always say in my book, I've said in my book, you know, if you can, you know, survive in Nigeria, you can survive anywhere. If you thrive in Nigeria, you can change the world. So having that kind of training ground for resilience and then using that, every sort of, all of that, you know, the muscle that you've built up and then coming to a place like America where you don't have to deal with it anymore, you can just focus on your work, you can really thrive. And I think that that's not the story of just Nigerians. I think it's a story of a lot of immigrants. That's why I think a lot of immigrants tend to come to America and do well because of what what sort of training they've had in their own countries. Yeah, it still seems, you know, when I when I thought about it and I started doing more reading about Nigeria, I, I even watched, uh, you know, you talk about the dance your dad did. I went and watched videos of what that That's dance amazing. looked <laughs> like. And, and so I, you know, I think there must be something else. People are coming from other very difficult circumstances, but there was, uh, uh, let, let's talk, let's, let's move to something practical because I, th- because I think it depicts the unusual quality that I'm now attributing to both your mother and the Nigerian culture. So she doesn't think you're doing as well in school as you ought to be doing. So she decides, I don't know who the hell would come up with this idea, except your mother. She's going to get the school syllabus for the whole goddamn year. Mm -hmm. And so the concept of you're going to learn this ahead of time, like who makes that up and how did it end up working? It was, it was genius actually. So my mother, you know, I wasn't doing well in school and I, I, even as a seven-year-old, I did not enjoy going to school. It was a battle. Um, to get me to go to school. I just didn't feel like I fitted in. I didn't feel like it was for me. Didn't feel welcomed. I was one of the only sort of black students in the school, certainly in my year, my grade. And so the teachers at the parents' teacher evening complained to my mother um, about, you know, my lack of engagement. So she, before she leaves, she asked the teacher for the school syllabus for the year. And she comes home and she figures out what I'm going to be learning in school in say a month or two from then. And she started to teach it to me at home beforehand. So if I was going to be the first one was the times tables. And I remember that so clearly, like it was yesterday, because I remember staying up late with her, learning the times tables, even though we hadn't learned learned it in school yet. And then I remember going to school and, you know, the teacher sort of starts with the two times tables, whatever. And at, and at home, I've already mastered the 11, 12 and 13 times <laughs> tables. 13. She even taught me the 13 times tables. And, you know, I knew all the answers. And my teacher was so impressed. You know, she was so impressed that this she almost thought I was a genius or something. I mean, she was just 
Mrs. Rossetti, I remember her to this day. I had to change the names, obviously, legally in the book, but um, her real name was um, Mrs. Rossetti. And so she would talk to my mom and she would say stuff like, this child is going to go to Oxford. Your child is so smart. And it wasn't that I was that smart. It was literally that my mother had taught me everything we were going to be learning in school ahead of time. And so school now became this place where I'd gone from feeling like I didn't really fit in, I didn't really belong, to this place where I now felt totally welcomed and totally embraced. The teachers now used me or, or, or sort of pointed to me as a role model for the other kids. I was getting praised and lauded. We had, um, we had this sort of sheet of gold stars. And I always had the most because anytime you did exceptional work, you'd get a gold star. And I began to really enjoy going to school. And it fueled my desire to come home and learn again with my mother. And it just, it just completely changed what school was for me. And then it also meant that I now understood for the very first time in my young life that what you put into something is what you get out. That was the first mm -hmm. time I, un and I, I, I understood, ah, if I work hard, then this is what happens in school. I like school more. I get praised by my teachers. And it just, you know, it, it sort of fueled itself. And so um, I think I... I think that was that played a small part in putting me on the path, uh, putting me on the path that I am on today. You know, it was I thought I, it's genius. But Zane, what I was imagining is your mother works in the pharmacy. I mean, there were two instances where she was robbed, and she does one one at knife point out on the street, and once in the pharmacy. She comes home. She doesn't even talk about it. She's she's got four kids. And she gets dinner on the table. She works six days a week. And then she does the goddamn school syllabus with you. I mean, I'm just thinking about it as a parent, right? You have two kids, a three-year-old and a under one-year-old, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, did you, did you have any concept when you were little or did your sister, well, your little sister wouldn't have, but did your brothers have any concept of what, how, how unimaginable this was that a woman could do this. Do you know what I think it is? I think that, I, and I, you know, I think this is a big part of it. I think living through war and also mm. to not just fend for herself, but fend for her siblings at such a young age and basically become a, she was a parent to her siblings, basically. Yeah. For all right. intents and purposes. And also the fact that my grandmother had done the same thing for her, as I mentioned, during the war, my grandmother, her kids weren't in school for two and a half years. So, you know, that she educated them. She helped. I mean, she had limited education of her, by herself on her own, but she was instrumental in teaching the very young kids, the smaller children, you know, basic math. You know, um, she told Igbo folk tales. That's our language. Um, she gave my mom donated textbooks to work through. On her own so even though mm -hmm. you know, they weren't in school they had study time you know even in the middle of a civil war they had study time and so it meant that my mother ended up doing very well in school despite the fact that she'd missed two and a half to three years of school when it came time for the um, final um, sort of examinations my mother ended up getting what is called a grade one which is like the highest honors and in our village no other woman had ever achieved such a distinction and so she was really lauded. And it was only because my grandmother created this environment where despite war, literally there was no excuse, not even a war is gonna stop my kids from learning, you know? And so coming from that kind of environment, I think that's what spurred my mom through that, honestly. I mean, there's no other real explanation because I am a mother myself and, I, and, I, and I'll tell you that, yeah, that would be difficult for me to um, come home from work, from anchoring on CNN and then, work through the night teaching yeah. ahead of time. But, I mean, but I haven't, I haven't had the training that my mother has had, that kind of resilience of living through a war zone and seeing the absolute worst and fighting through that, you know, that has, that really strengthened her. So, yeah. Well, and it made me curious when I think about, uh, so I have a son whose grandparents are Holocaust survivors and they were high, you know, all the things that you would think and you saw with your mom, they were hardworking, they were, you know, they were insane about our working hard, we expected to do that. And my son would say to me, 
well, mom, where's my grit going to come from? Like you got your grit because, you know, grampy and grandma were who they were, but how are you going to make me have that grit when I'm like an American kid in private school in New Haven, Connecticut? And I would ask you the same question, right? So you have, you were the beneficiary of your mother's own experience and you did respond to what she taught you, but how do you think about that in now raising your kids? I mean, you have a few, you have a little bit of time to figure it out, but you know, how do you think about that? Yeah. I mean, the thing is, is that, um, you know, it is, it does seem to be true that, um, you know, a lot of sort of successful people have experienced some degree of trauma in their lives. Um, different variations and different versions of trauma, but trauma nonetheless. And, you know, it's this very sort of fine line where you want your child to have some degree of hardship, not too much, you know, but some degree to really sort of toughen them up and spur them to work harder. You know, at the same time, you want your child to have a much easier life than you had but then mm -hmm. again not too easy you know not too easy so it's um so they they sort of just don't want to work hard at all um and so for me my personal resilience obviously I didn't live through a civil war but what my mother did do for me was she sent me we'll talk about this back to Nigeria to live for two years which is again very common among Nigerian immigrants a lot of Nigerian it's called immigrants. shipping back right Jokingly, we, we jokingly call it shipping back, but a lot of Nigerian immigrants who um, raising their kids in the West, um, basically for two, two years or so, sometimes more, will send their kids back to Nigeria to live without them, so without their parents, with extended relatives, usually grandparents, for two years to teach them hard, basically to toughen them up and to teach them hard work, resilience, um, you know, you're doing things like fetching water from the local stream, that's your drinking water, there's no washing machine, so you're washing your clothes by hand. You know, a lot of the toilets, you get your head shaved. I got my I got my hair cut off completely. I mean, a lot of a lot of uh, sort of uh, early teenage girls do that in Nigeria as well. We'll we'll get into that, but it's sort of like you are in a, thrust into a completely different environment, and now you have to fight for everything. You know, there's nothing that you can take for granted. Not even turning on your faucet and expecting water to come out. Um, people at times catch their own food. I did a couple of times, but with my cousins, but it, it's, and that kind of training ground for resilience, you come back to the West after living through that, you are a completely different person. Um, I did not take, when I came back to live in England, I remember coming back after two years in Nigeria, I remember turning on the faucet and having water come out of the faucet in my mom's house. And I thought to myself, oh, we have running water. My mother is so rich. Oh my God. I come from- So Zane, would you send your kids to Nigeria for two years? Can you imagine that? Well, the thing is, I have definitely um, thought about it, entertained it in my mind. I think the couple of things that are, that would stop me. Number one, my husband is not Nigerian, he's American. So it is, it's so- far-fetched for him this idea of sending your kids to a, a country that he technically doesn't really have a connection to but also when I went to Nigeria I had a whole community there mm. um to welcome I was going to ask you does that still exist no so my grandparents have all passed away all four of them um my mom technically lives in London she spends a lot of time in Nigeria but if she was there full-time that would be a different story mm -hmm. um and and your siblings aren't there my siblings aren't there. Whereas, so for me, when I went to Nigeria, I had my grandparents, I had my dad's siblings, some of them were there. I had some of my mom's siblings there as well. I had an entire network of people who were constantly making sure that I was okay, you know, and people who just loved me. And my sister also was shipped back as well. You know, there was just, there was just an inbuilt environment, a community of love. If I sent my kids back, I don't even know who they would stay. It just wouldn't work. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Um, so it's just different times, unfortunately, but we have talked about them going for, for summers, um, maybe with my mom, if, if she sort of is there at the same time. Yeah. It, 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 so there's so much more to cover and people are just going to have to read the book, but there's two things I want to make sure 
uh, that we get to, because I think um, one of them is such a practical example of what we hear a lot about is missing for black kids in the United States. So share with us your mother's uplifter program. <laughs> I love that you call that program. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I consider. <laughs> yeah, so listen, I mean, listen, if I'm completely honest, we all dealt with racism, you know, living in London. This would be in the early, early 90s. You know, my mother certainly dealt with a lot of racism. And, you know, what racism does is it makes you feel less than. Mm -hmm. You feel inferior. And you sort of believe that, well, you know, because I'm black, people see me this way, and that means that I can't achieve X, Y, Z. So my mother went to extraordinary lengths to try to erase that and to try to upend our perception of what it meant to be black. And you know, there is a saying that the only thing that can hold a person back in life is the perception that they have of themselves. And so, you know, my mother really changed that perception by. She would find all these articles of black success stories. So, you know, from like some key British newspapers, anyone, I mean, it was things like poets, writers, um, even people in entertainment, um, who anyone who had done something extraordinary, you know, anyone who had somehow um, achieved something just quite remarkable in terms of their career. And she would cut out these articles and she would plaster them to our walls. And she also had a binder as well that she would flip through in the evenings and she would show us, you know? And um, it meant that we would come home and we would be bombarded with images of people who looked like us who were doing extraordinary things with their lives. And, you know, even though she focused on black success, because obviously we're black, I think that in a way this can apply to everyone because mm -hmm. every child, regardless of your race, every child will have a tape that plays in their head about what they can and can't achieve and why. And because your children's thoughts are not printed on their forehead, it can be quite difficult as a mother to know what tape is playing in your child's head. Um, that's such a great line, Zane. That's, a, that's such an important statement that... As parents, you don't know what tape's playing in their head. And really, as I'm listening to you, your mother was creating the tape. Yeah, I mean, if you have black children who are minorities in an all white society, I mean, it's quite obvious what the tape is, you know, because my mother had experienced it herself. You know, and she knew that we were dealing with racism at school, so it was obvious. But I think for a lot of people, it might not be obvious what the tape is and which makes it difficult. But, you know, if you can find a way to change the tape that plays mm -hmm. in your child's head and to find a way of, of making sure that, you know, you can improve your child's perception of themselves in some small way, I think that can have a profound impact on their lives. And so, you know, by just seeing people that look like us who are doing, you know, just amazing things with their lives, we began to slowly believe that we could too. I mean, she drummed it into our heads that the people in these articles, they are just like you. It's no difference. If you work hard, like they have worked hard, you can have what they have. And so, you know, a lot of people of color, um, obviously I grew up in England, when it came to things like applying to places like Oxford and Cambridge, I'm sure it's the same for Harvard and Yale here, a lot of people of color, even if they have perfect SAT score, even if they have the perfect grades, they don't apply. They don't even apply because they just sort of think that, you know, those places are just not for them. You know, they, that's what they believe. And in a way, they're not wrong. However, you know, when it came to applying to Oxford, and we'll talk about Oxford in a second, because my mother had worked so hard to change the tape in my head, I really believed that I deserved to go there. Um, when it came to applying, there was no part of me that thought, well, you know, because I'm black, I can't know. But that this cracked me up. That that scene totally cracks. So there are two scenes that there were a lot that made me smile, but this one cracked me up. So in England, in order to even apply to Oxford or any school, you need your teachers to sign on that this is the grade that they're going to project for you. And then obviously you have to make it happen. But first they have to even believe 
that this projected grade is achievable, right? So yeah. your grade. mother, your mother goes there to talk to them about going to Oxford, and they're like, you know, go home and take some drugs. You know, there is she's a smart enough girl. She could maybe go to University of Edinburgh, but she's not going to Oxford. But your mother at the age of 16 took the first of six trips with you in the car just That's for it. you to 13 yeah. when I was to 13. soak it in to soak it in yeah yeah no she I mean yeah she started young when I was young so um at the age of 13 my mother would take me to visit Oxford just so I could see just so I could see and believe you know in the possibility of me one day going there and at the time, I had no idea what Oxford University was. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know why it was so prestigious. I could barely even pronounce it. Um, but we would just go on these trips where we would just walk around. And Oxford University doesn't really have a campus. So it's kind of like NYU, where it's blended in uh, with the rest of the city. And we would go on these trips and um, these mother-daughter trips. And slowly but surely, it began to feel, as I, especially as I learned a bit more about the university, it began to feel normal, this idea that I could one day go there for university. And it got to the point where when I was in trouble, you know, if I'd stayed out late or if I'd rebelled or if I'd done something, rather than grounding me, my mother would <laughs> take me back to visit Oxford. Yeah, she would drive me, back. <laughs> she would drive me back to show me something better to aspire to. You know, she be, kind of became obsessed with it because as an immigrant for her, especially as an immigrant growing up in a colonial Nigeria. Yeah, British colonial country. Yeah, I mean, this idea of Oxford, I mean, it really was, you know, th this gilded city in her mind. And she, 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 she just believed that that would be the ticket to a better life for her kids. And also she's not completely wrong because um, England is a class system. I'm sure you know. Yes. There is limited social mobility for a lot of people, especially people of color. Generally, if you are born poor, you're going to stay America, that way. <laughs> it's not like America, right? And, and America has its problems as well, but England is a completely different world. And there are a few avenues, um, you know, to make it out. And one of them is going to a prestigious university. That is. Mm. That is absolutely a way that you can sort of elevate your social economic status. And so my mother just got it into her head that that would be the ticket to a better life for, for me. And, um, you know, nothing was going to stand in her way. And so when my teachers were like, you know, your daughter is smart, but she's not Oxford material. Oxford requires genius level intelligence and your daughter is not there yet. Um, my mother came home and she told me, and she was really disappointed because she'd obviously spent the last several years taking me to visit Oxford, um, sort of planting the seed that it was there. It was, you know, she, she'd seen that with all of the um, images of black success that she had sort of shoved in my face, that that was actually having an impact. And, you know, visiting Oxford, she believed would do the same for me. And so when the teacher said, I, you know, they wouldn't, support me if I applied, um, that fighter spirit kicked in again. And so she paced her bedroom and she was like, what can I do? How can I guarantee that my child is gonna go to Oxford? Like, what can I do to make it happen? She came to me and she said, I figured it out. I know exactly what to do to guarantee that you are gonna get into Oxford University. And I was like, what mom? And yeah, she basically decided that she was gonna ban me from watching any television whatsoever until I had an actual Oxford acceptance letter in hand. No TV, and pay phone. No TV. And then, yeah, because I spent all my time now without television, I, I, I used all my spare time on the pay phone, talking to boys and talking to anyone who would listen. She found a creative solution for that too, where she, I don't, I don't know if you can get these in America, but in England, you can get, these things called residential pay phones. And they're very small landlines, but they have a slot on the side for coins. And you can find them in doctor's offices. They're not these like big sort of telephone mm -hmm. or anything like that. And so she brought one home, they're not expensive. And um, you know, if you wanna make a call with one of these phones, you've got to put in 20 pence, you know, the equivalent of a quarter. And so she said to me, you know what? You can use the phone all you want, but you have to pay for it yourself. And so, I did use the phone occasionally, you know, because um, 
I, you know, any sort of 20p or any coin that I had, but I could only speak for like three or four minutes. Um, and, and did so, you have to call your mom collect to tell you you got accepted to Oxford? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. In fact, I had to call my mom collect for anything. We, in England, we call it reverse charge phone calls. And so, um, you know, without anything to distract me, my mom basically eliminated all distractions. That was her strategy for getting me into Oxford. And so without television and without basically a phone, um, a free phone, I guess, I had much more time to devote towards my studies and I worked and worked and worked. And so, you know, I always say to people, I didn't get into Oxford University because I'm a genius or because I'm, I was the smartest person in my school. I got into Oxford because my mother basically created an environment where I had nothing else to do but study. That's how I got it. And that is the truth. I mean, you know, people who kn knew me back then could see this dramatic jump in my grades from, you know, being, I wasn't a terrible student. I was still, yeah. A minus B plus kind of student. And then when she eliminated television and eliminated distractions, I became not just a straight A student, but in some of my practice exams, I was getting every answer correct, which had never happened before. Mm. And um, yeah, I mean, when, it, when I got the acceptance letter into Oxford, I had to call my mom to tell her and I was so emotional, but um, I didn't have any coins. So the way I, you know, we could always call um, if there was an emergency by just calling collect. And so I would, I called the operator and I was like, can you put me through to my mom's pharmacy? And um, yeah, she reversed, she accepted the charges. And I told her, and it was just so emotional. For, oh my God, I, I'm going to even tear up mm -hmm. uh, thinking about it because it was just- And the village in Nigeria had their own party to celebrate. <laughs> yeah. your... Well, Zane, you know, we're, we're, we've run out of time except for one last question um, that I, I can't help but, ask you and for those uh, listening you know there's there's so much we didn't get to and so much other conversation that you know we might end up with like a part two to this about you know what does this mean for kids who don't have someone like your mother what what are the lessons because I think there are many uh, that you share in the book that are applicable to lots of people, but they take, you know, like your mother had an, an eight hour segment rule, eight hours for school or work, eight hours for sleep, and then eight hours to make your dreams happen. So you'll notice that no word I mentioned was leisure. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I, I grew up in the same kind of house where if you, you know, if you wanted to play that was like close to a sin is because there was like work to do there was something um to be done and you know we didn't even talk about your brother Chiwetel where you where your mother starts learning Shakespeare so she can read plays with him so I do hope people will um you know we haven't talked about why you have two small children a big job and then decide to write a book um but I I I I really hope people pick this up and I, I hope you continue to spread the word about um, how this, not only your incredible story and your mom's story, because this is really a book about your mom, but about what this means for all of us as we try to sort of make our way in the world. But the probably obvious question uh, for me to ask you is all four of you are wildly successful you know as I mentioned your brother who was uh um played Benjamin Northrop in 12 Years a Slave was a, a Solomon, Solomon. Solomon Solomon I yeah. I actually read the book before I saw the movie oh you did One of the I, read you. <laughs> it's really it's really worth reading um anyway um what would your father say seeing the four of you and do you think he'd be surprised or this is what he would have expected your mom to make happen oh my god that's such a beautiful question um what would he think i mean i think one of the most important things um as i mentioned my dad was a doctor 
right? But I wouldn't say that, that was his passion. He became a doctor because that was what was expected of him. And he had his family in Nigeria, his mom, you know, his dad, actually his dad had passed away by then, but who were saying to him, okay, you know what, you're gonna go to England, that's fine. But, you know, obviously what's expected of immigrants when they move to a new country is to send money home and take care of their family back home. So he became a doctor, not because it was his passion, but because that was what was expected of him. And as I mentioned, he was so passionate about the arts and literature and music and, you know, just expressing himself, you know, just expressing his soul in the most creative, artistic way possible. I think for him, what would give him the most joy and the most pride is, you know, the fact that in a way we have all lived out um, some of the dreams that my father had that he wasn't, he didn't live long enough to accomplish himself. Um, and so my mother, for my mother, it's, it's sort of like, you know, my dad had spent his whole life doing something that wasn't really for him and doing a job that he wasn't super passionate about and lost his life you know, didn't really get to live out his dreams fully. I mean, he had an album or two that he released, but that was it. And so my brother is an actor and that is, you know, um, that there's part of my dad that my mother always says that he channels on stage because my dad also acted in, in school. I studied languages. My dad lived in France. He lived in Mexico. He loved languages. He actually did part of his medical degree in Spanish. Um, and he was so passionate about connecting with people of all walks of life, as I am. Uh, my sister, like my dad, is a doctor. And um, my eldest brother is a successful entrepreneur. And my dad had always had these passions and these dreams about, you know, obviously he helped my mother open the pharmacy and he had all these dreams of starting his own business or even having another pharmacy in London one day. And so I think what would give him the most joy is that all of the dreams that he held close to his heart, that he never was able to sort of see to fruition, his four children have almost done it for him. And so mm. I'm so proud of that, that, you know, we've all taken a piece of my dad and, you know, kept his memory alive through what we have chosen as our careers. And I think that, mm. you know, I think that he would be too. And plus we're happy, you know, none of us have gone into careers that, um, that we're sort of bored by or that, you know, we're not engaged in particularly. We're very aware that we only have one life, you know? And I think that when, you're, when your father dies so young or you lose a parent so young, you are aware that you really do only have one life. And I'm, you know, none of us are sort of ever going to waste this amazing opportunity that we've had mm -hmm. in terms of life by doing something that, you know, we're not crazy about. So yeah, he lives through us. Zane, thank, that was, that's a, that's just a phenomenal, wonderful answer. Um, we've been talking with Zane Asher, the author of Where the Children Take Us, How One Family Achieved the Unimaginable. You know, Zane, we could probably go on for <laughs> the podcast has its own little time frame, um, but I've, um, I'm very grateful to you for the conversation and delighted that you were able to join us. Roxanne, thank you so much for having me and for sharing our story. <laughs>